to see you again men um, men and power this is the third study we've looked I talked about the principles of power what power is and really it's it's just authority power is just the energy that, that gives the authority control over but I've called this one the balance of power and uh, I'm looking at the difference between unity Equality and authority. We know that power is authority, don't we? That's the power of the authority. But I found that many Christians don't know the difference between unity and authority. They think if you're equal with somebody, then you're equal in authority. But that's not the biblical way. Being one in the Bible is unity. It's nothing to do with authority. Uh, and I'm going to look at different areas. We're going to look uh, in our marriage at work and in the church because that's the three areas of, our, areas of our life. We always try and touch on those in the seminars because some men are in business here, some men are pastors, some men are husbands. So that's the area that men would have problems with at work, at church and at home. And we all have different uh, emphasis. Some have more problem at home than at church. Some people have more church than at home. And some people have more Problems at work than church or home. It, it's, it's different for every man. But th those are the three areas that concern men, isn't it? Your work, your marriage, and, and your church life. So let, let's start off with marriage. For many of you, that will be the most difficult to get the power balance. Because you dif know the difference between unity equality and authority will help us to get this power balance right in our marriage. So, in our marriage, the marriage bed that the Bible talks about, we'd talk about sex now, wouldn't we? But the Bible says the marriage bed is undefiled. It means sexual relationships. So let's talk about that. Now, the Bible clearly tells us that there is no authority in your relationship with your wife. Did you know that? There's no authority in relationship because relationship is to do with unity. I'll explain the difference. I think I can convince you. Just don't shoot me yet. I've only just started. So let's, let's look at the scripture, 1 Corinthians 7. I like Paul's teaching because he's strong, isn't he? And uh, for me, he puts things very plainly. He doesn't beat about the bush. It's preachers that do that, isn't it? The Bible's very straightforward. The Corinthian church obviously, obviously had problems and wrote to Paul about them because Paul's answering a, a marriage counselling problem. Now concerning the things that you wrote to me, it's good for a man not to touch a woman. He's advocating celibacy here, Paul. Not as a law, but he's saying it's, it's good. But he said, nevertheless, to avoid fornication, if you have a strong sexual drive and you, you feel you need a woman, don't try and abstain and then get yourself in problems. Get yourself a wife, for goodness sake. And let every woman have her own husband. Jesus said it's a hard saying to the disciples, and not everyone can bear it. Because when Jesus told Peter all the troubles he'd have in the flesh, he said, oh, Lord, it's better if no one gets married then. He says, well, yeah, but he said not many can do it. And it's not, you know... We knock celibacy, don't we? It's wrong to impose it on people 
The Catholic Church are wrong to say you've got to be celibate. That's wrong. But celibacy is, is a, a worthy cause for a Christian, not for a non-Christian. So you can give yourself to God because we're married to Christ. So you can look after the affairs of Christ rather than your wife. Because I've got a wife and I've got to see how I can please her. If I was celibate, I could just please God. I'm a weak man, I need a woman, and God knows. Give me a good wife, that's all right. But this is the bit. Let the husband render unto the wife due benevolence. And likewise also the wife, the husband. And he's talking about sexual relationship, you see. The wife has not power over her own body but her husband. Well, I like that bit, do you? That's okay. In other words, I can demand sex whenever I want it, to put it plainly. She's not got power over her own body, it's mine. Well, we've had the teaching from Joni. You'll come under your husband, he'll, he'll, be your, he'll rule over you, which is authority, isn't it? If you rule over somebody, it's authority. But Paul's not talking about authority. But then he throws a cat amongst the pigeon and said, Likewise also, the husband hath not power over his own body. It's your wife's. There's an equality for you. That's equality. I'm in authority over my wife, aren't you? We know that from the Bible. But there's a difference between authority and unity. Relationship is about coming together, about unity. And in relationship, in unity, there's an equality. That's why Paul could say there's neither male nor female, Greek nor barbarian, rich or poor, bond or free. There's no, because it's to do with the unity of the church. That's nothing to do with authority. How can he say there's neither male nor female when he says men rule your own wives? Pastors rule the church. How can Paul tell the pastor, rule, rule the church with all authority, Timothy? How can he say that if there's neither pastor or flock? There's a difference between authority and unity. I think, you know, it's a difficult concept if you've never studied it, but I'm hoping to carry you all along with me. I'm hoping to convince you. If after the study I've not convinced you, there's no chance you'll... Because I, I, I think I can show you from Scripture... Defraud not one another, except it be with a consent for a time. If you give yourself to prayer and fasting, if you agree. So that means I'm the head of my wife. I have authority over my wife. But not in relationship. If I want to make love tonight, and my wife doesn't, I can't think, well, I'm glad I'm the man I have the last say. My word goes. Paul says no. Her body's yours, but, but your body is hers. So there's an equality there. And yet a man always has authority over his wife. But not in the relationship. You can't have a relationship when you've got unequal authority. In the relationship. Otherwise you get a bully. It's not a relationship. A man who goes home and demands his wife have sex every every. Every time he walks through the door, that's not a relationship. He's a bully, isn't he? Satisfying his own lusts. There's got to be an equality in relationship. Do you know something? The only reason you can have a relationship with God is because of the, there's been an equality. He's not ashamed to call us brothers. What does Jesus say? It's crazy. He says, I in you, and you in me, and I in God, and the Father in me, that we all become one. But that doesn't give you authority like God's got. That gives you unity. That we all become one. Whenever it talks about becoming one in the Bible, it is not talking about authority. It's talking about becoming one, a relationship, unity. Because a man always has authority over his wife. You can't lose it. If your wife wears the trousers, you've still got authority. So you're not using it. It's been given to you. You cannot lose your authority. It's God-given. The man is the head of the woman. We'll look at the scripture. It doesn't say the man should be the head of the woman. It says the man is the head of the woman. So you may be a lousy head. You may not be using your authority. She may be wearing the trousers, but in God's eyes, you're still the head. That's important to, to, to know that, men. 
It's fixed. Christ will always be the head of the church, even when the church is rebellious. It doesn't stop him being the head. Can you some relationship is flexible, is one of my little catchphrases for you to learn. Relationship unity is flexible, authority is fixed. It will never change. If you work for a boss, he'll always have the control over you, the power, the authority over you. If you're married, then the husband always has authority over you. It will never change. In any circumstances, a woman never has authority over a man. In any circumstance. Authority. Now, in your relationship, you're one. You can't have a good relationship without equality. That's why we're all one in Christ. The priesthood of all believers. You could have a better relationship with God than your pastor. But he has the authority. They're completely different issues. Unity and relationship are different than authority. Jesus will always be subject to his father. He says, I do nothing of myself. I only do what the father shows me. He said, my father is greater than I. And in Corinthians it says, when Christ has come and taken all authority, why? Because it's been given him. Sit on my right hand until your enemies become your footstool. And when God says to Christ, go and inherit your kingdom and rule on earth, and Christ reigns on earth for a thousand years, it says, and then Jesus will give the authority back to the one who gave him the authority. That God may be all in all. God will be the final authority throughout all eternal life. And Jesus will always be under him. There's a fixed order, it will never ever change. But I and the Father are one. But we think that's equality of authority. There's no such thing as equality of authority, only equality of relationship. And people get mixed up. And it's, for me, it's very fundamental that Christians understand it. There's many wrong doctrines come because we don't understand the difference. Let's look at some of the scriptures on unity. John 14, 20. At that day ye shall know that I am in the Father, and ye in me, and I in you. Now, if we're in Christ and he's in the Father, then that makes us part of the Trinity, doesn't it? To a lot of people. Replaces the Holy Ghost with us. He never mentions the Holy Ghost when he's talking about unity. Have you noticed in the Bibles? It's always I in the Father and the Father in me. Never, never in the Holy Ghost in me and the, I in the Holy Ghost. It's always the Father and the Son. But we can have the same relationship. Turn over to ch ch chapter 15, verse 4. Abide in me and I in you. There it is again. That doesn't give us the same authority as Christ because we're one with him, does it? Becoming one doesn't give, give equal authority. Because I've become one with my wife, which is relationship, doesn't give us equal authority. And I've become one with Christ. Because if Jesus says, I, you're in me, and I'm in the Father, that's scary. If you think that equal unity is equal authority, you've got the authority of God and of Jesus. Whereas we haven't, we have to use Jesus' name. And Jesus says, I don't do anything of myself, I only do what the Father shows me. I can do nothing of myself. This is Jesus. So he's not equal in authority with God. He's got the same character of God. In essence, he's the same as God. He has God's character, God's mind. But he's subject himself. And will always be subject. Once, once there's an order, God never changes orders. Did you know that? God never changes his order in creation, in anything. When God sets an order, it's fixed. Relationships change like the wind. But authorities are fixed. They're like law. The laws of gravity will never change on circumstances, on emotions, on relationships. Gravity will always work. If you jump over the cliff when you're happy, they'll scrape you up. If you jump over the cliff when you're depressed, they'll still scrape you up. Emotions and circumstances don't alter the law of gravity. It's a fixed law. And the laws of God's order never change, never will throughout eternity. And we mix up the two. 1 Corinthians 11. Verse 3. But I would have you know that the head of every man is Christ. And the head of the woman is the man. 
So far, so good. And the head of Christ is God. He's talking about authority there. He's not talking about relationship, is he? He's talking about head. Head is authority, power over them. So the man has power over his wife. Joni taught that, didn't she? That was part of a curse. And he shall rule over you. He'll now be your head. As well as your relation, as well as being one with you, he's one with you, but he's, he's going to rule over you. In authority, the man is above the woman. Christ is the head of his church. The pastor is the head of the church. And the boss will be ahead of his workers. All the problems in the world are because of this imbalance. That people don't know the difference. That's why the world's loused up. I know pastors and they think they've got to keep separate from the flock. You know, well, you're like, you know, don't, don't get too friendly with your congregation. Well, I'm sorry, you'll not have unity with them. You'll become a dictator, you'll have your authority. But if you want relationship, you've got to get a bit dirty sometimes, haven't you? You've got to be with them. You can't have a relationship unless you feel at one. And unless the, the church feel at one with the pastor, no relationship. He's in authority, he's the, well, he's the pastor. But if he's unapproachable, there's no relationship. If you're a boss and your workers can't approach you because you're too touchy, you're in authority, you've got no relationship. If your wife can't criticise your men because you're too touchy, you're the authority. You've got a bad relationship. Because relationship is becoming one. Thinking like one. And it's equal. In authority, you have it. Can you see how easy it is to use the authority to think, well, I'm... I'm then. I know from experience, watching my dad pastor a church from nothing, building it up to 400 over 40 years, so that's a fair experience. I've seen the difference in a man almost without exception. When you take a man and you say, oh, Bill, I've been praying about it and uh, I feel you should be a deacon. He grows an inch taller when you tell him. And it often ruins a man. Because he's a deacon, he feels he has to stand a bit straight and now he starts wearing a tighter church. Because deacons wear ties, you see. He used to come in his sweatshirt before, but he's a deacon now, so he better... his wife said, hey, you're a deacon. Women are the worst because they get mad at it. Well, if you're a deacon, you know, they won't respect if you go to church like that. Am I right? So he wears a tie. He's forgot what being a deacon is completely. But he thinks he's got to exercise authority. He forgets he's no different than the man who gives the hymn books out, you see. And he loses his unity with the people because he feels now a little bit different, a little bit elite, if the truth's known. He wouldn't say that word. But he's not elite. He's just one of the body of Christ. The pastor's not elite. He's just a, a weak sinner like everyone else in the congregation. And he should tell them so. He's no better than them. He doesn't treat his, pastors don't treat their wives any better than the congregation. Did you know that? They have as many rows as you do. They lose their temper just as many times. They're no different. They've only set themselves up as somebody different. They frighten it if they tell you that they're normal that you'll lose faith in them. But you can't have unity with your pastor. If he's an idol, if he's an icon, I wish I was like my pastor. Good job you don't know him. You'd stay yourself. <laughs> you would stay yourself if you live with your pastor for six months. Maybe. I don't know how you live, but that's, that's a generalisation. But do you get my point? Unless we understand that unity is nothing to do with authority. You cannot lose your authority. You've got it. It's insecurity that makes you want to exercise authority when you don't need to. Because you've got it. So you don't have to prove it. If you've got it, you don't have to prove it. When you're trying to prove it, it proves that you don't really have it. When a man realises he has complete authority... And he realises his wife is not trying to fight him for it. You need both. Then he can share as much of his authority as he wants. Because he never loses it. Shall I say that again? 
when a man realises that he has complete, utter authority over every decision that's ever made, because decisions are not to do with relationship, they're to do with authority, aren't they? You have a right, men, to tell your wife how long her hair should be. You have a right to tell her what clothes to wear. You have a right to tell her what wallpaper is in the house. These are decisions of authority. I want the house like this. You have a right to, but you're a fool if you exercise all your rights. You'll have a lousy unity. <laughs> but you have a right to because you are the complete authority in the house. It's no point to say, well, I've got the authority over the money, but she has the authority over the cooking and over the wallpaper and the decorating because I'm lousy at that. It's nothing to do whether you're lousy or who does it. It doesn't matter whether your wife does it or the plumber comes and does it. It doesn't matter who does it, you're in complete authority. Now, when you realise you have complete authority, and when you've got a good wife who's not trying to fight it, you can say, look, love, will you... We decorate now, you decide the colours. That's not giving your authority away, that's delegating it. You've not lost your authority, you've still got it. At any time you could say, well, I'm sorry, but you've gone too far. I've got to put my foot down there. But a good wife won't. A good wife will then say, because you've given her authority, she'll say, well, I've picked yellow and cream and that. What do you think, love? They won't go and do it and say, well, he's given me a thought. I'm going to do it, stick it what he likes. He said I can do it. I'm going to paint pin panthers all over the wall. So can you see how it works when, you, when you're not fighting, when she's not fighting your authority? You realise you've got it whether you use it or not. You can give it as much as you want. And then she can think, well, that's brilliant. My husband's left me completely to it. And she'll ask you counsel. And that's nice then. And she says, what do you think of that? And you say, oh, brilliant, that love. Or, well, maybe you think that. Yeah, okay. And then you feel great, don't you? She's come and ask you for help. Don't you want a helpless woman? Come and ask you, what do you think of this, Dan? And should I do this? Isn't it nice when your wife's asked you advice instead of telling you what to do? Isn't it wonderful when she says, what do you think about this, love? Instead of saying, you didn't do that, you know, and you should do that, and you're not a good husband, and can you do this? And why haven't you done that? Isn't it wonderful? She says, I need help. What, what do you think about this? What should I do, darling? Isn't that nice when you, you be the man and say, well, I think, darling, it'd be nice. <laughs> you feel good when people need you. It's great, isn't it, when your kids say, Daddy, can you help me with this? And you know you can. And your wife asks you for advice and you say, yeah, cool. Leave it to me, love, I'll handle it. It's great. Isn't it wonderful when you're not fighting for authority? Then you get a good unity, a good relationship. You'll never get... The key to, to, to you know, having a complete authority is getting a good relationship. But you can't do it if your wife is fighting you for it. That's the key. If your wife is fighting you for authority, you cannot have unity. You'll always have the blow-ups, you'll always have the tizwas and the, the paddies and the screaming abdabs, won't you? Skin and air flying, or doors coming off the hinges, or <coughs> plates flying, you'll always have it. Because there's a fight for authority. So that stops the unity, doesn't it? And we all want unity, but the key is the authority. And that's, that's the difficulty, because we have it, but how do we use it? If you're too heavy-handed, you've gone the other way. If you're too soft, I can't answer that. It's, you've all got different wives, it'd be easy. I could tell you how to treat my wife, but then it wouldn't work, because you're not me. If you said the things I say to my wife, you'd probably get a pan over your head. <laughs> you've got a, we're all different, aren't we? And I say some things to my wife and she'll obey me. If I said it to your wife, I'd get the pan over my head. See, I can't help you with that. Nobody can help you with relationship. I can't help you with your relationship with God. It's personal. Get in your closet and sort it out with God. Get your wife on her own and sort it out. I can't help you with that. We can lay principles. Now, authority is easy, I can tell you, because it's fixed. I can't tell you about a moving target. You've got to catch your own wife, haven't you? The greatest compliment ever want, I've ever had about my relationship with Joni, I'm not saying ours is a perfect marriage, I'm not, I'm just saying the greatest compliment was when I, I, I went somewhere and people with my wife and somebody said to my wife, it, 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 in essence, I, she had no control, he's got control over you, hasn't he, that little fella? He's got control over you. You, you. you do everything he says. You know, she must be frightened of me. He thought I had the screws and I really got her under control. They didn't like it. She thought that I was in complete control. And that, I wouldn't have liked that compliment. That wouldn't be nice. 
The other half of the compliment is when, um, when the opposite was said. And they said to me, you're like a lapdog to your wife. She really pulls you on a string, doesn't she? And I realised they couldn't decide who had the authority. They couldn't decide. I know I've got authority, I've no problem with that. But they couldn't decide because we had such a good relationship that I was happy to give Joni all the authority I wanted because it's still mine. You can't give it away, you can only delegate it. You've still got it when you delegate it. And it's nice when they don't know who's wearing the trousers. That means there's a relationship, they can't understand it. Because there's no conflict, you see. <coughs> conflict means there's a power struggle in the marriage. And when they see no power struggle and they can't see who's, who's on top, it's a good comp Do you understand what I was saying? It was a real compliment to me. I thought, hey, that's, that's not like that all the time. I'm, I'm just saying it happened. And it, it showed we had the unity, the relationship. So God shared his authority with Jesus, but never lost it. When God delegates authority, he never loses it. Jesus said, all power has been given to me on heaven and on earth. Who gave it to him? You can't give it to your authority. He says, all power has been given to me on heaven and on earth. Well, God must have given him his authority. But God never lost it when he gave it. He delegated. Do you understand? You don't lose it. God didn't feel insecure because he'd give all authority to Jesus, did he? Did God say, oh, I've not got as much authority now. I've given it all to Jesus. When you've got authority and you give it, you don't lose it. You're really only delegating. And that's helped me a lot. So the principle doesn't, need, doesn't change, does it? We need to learn that, I think, understand it and practice it. I, I feel I need to more in my marriage. Let's look at work. So you can have a good relationship. I'm talking about a worker now, not a boss. You can have a good relationship, good unity with your boss. Let's take an example. Let, let's take the secretary, the boss's secretary. All right, it's, it's the world, not the church, because these things don't happen in the church, or we pretend they don't. But. So the boss has got a secretary, and he's got a good relationship with her. Let's say it goes too far, and she becomes his mistress. Let, let's suppose. So he's got a wonderful relationship with her. He's the boss. She's only the secretary. I mean, the secretary's one of the lowest, isn't she? Because he's got his, his under-managers and his fellow directors and that. He's a director. So he's got a relationship with somebody well down the scale. That's what I'm saying. There's an inequality in authority. The boss can sack her and the rest of the firm. He owns it. She can't even sack herself. She's just a, a lower employee. She just gets her wages every week. And yet, in relationship, she could become one with the boss. In fact, she could manipulate the firm through the boss. You heard what Joni said about the power of women, how they can manipulate men. So the secretary could actually be controlling the firm. Well, that's how they worked. That's how they, they, they did with spies, didn't they? They got women to sleep with diplomats, to learn the secrets and to suggest things to them and control them. The way of a man with a maid, Joni talked about it, the power of a woman... Women have changed dictatorships. Women have changed governments. Do you remember the Profumo affair? Most of you won't, but... Men's weakness for women have brought governments down and, and dictators down. And often they were the men were set up. Most times they were set up. But although she's got a wonderful relationship with the boss and he with her, and they one in spirit, in unity, they love each other to bits, it doesn't stop him being the boss, it doesn't make them both secretaries. Because equality of authority would mean they both have to be managing directors, or they both have to be secretaries, wouldn't they? But he stays the boss, she stays the secretary, but in unity, in relationship, they could be equal. That's a good example, isn't it? There's no difference in relationship. They can go and, and you know, have a fight each other and, and she's on an equal footing with him. She can argue and say it's relationship. But in authority, he's always her boss. She's always the secretary. So for a boss, to have and understand authority is to actually share it. 
Because you still have it. You don't lose it if you're secure. If you're insecure, you've lost it. But if you give it and know that you still have it. Many pastors have problems. Because they delegate authority and are frightened to take it away again. I'm amazed. A pastor will make somebody a deacon. The deacon should never have been a deacon. And he realised it after six months, he realised that he is... is it's ruined him, he'd be better off back in the pew. But the pastor's frightened to say, excuse me, brother, let's have a talk. You, you don't really fit in that job. A wise pastor won't say you're sacked. he said, say, I, I've been praying about it and I, and I feel I've got a job for you. And promote him to another job that's not deacon. Don't demote him, promote him <coughs> to another job. Don't leave him empty with egg on his face. His wife says, oh, you're a failure. And the church thinks, what's happened with him? He's not a deacon anymore. Has he had some sexual immorality? Has he been fiddling the collections? The church are like that. They'll think something bad. So promote him. Be diplomatic. Be as wise as a serpent. Serpent's the devil. Be as cunning as him, as gentle as a dove. Say with your workers... I heard a tape from an American man who was a multi-billionaire and he believed in treating his workers really well. And if he found a man was useless at a job, he didn't say, look, you're useless, I'll sack you. He used to pray about it and think, Lord, this man was made in your image. Maybe he's a round, round peg in a square hole. Maybe he just needs a different job. And he'd chat with the man and put him in another job. And he found, amazingly enough, at another job he could excel. He really loved it. He was just in the wrong job, not that he was useless. The job was too difficult for his brain, or he had a brain power and he was using his hands. He should have been in administration or something. Most people are in the wrong jobs. The sheep, they need managing. Most people in the church are in the wrong jobs. They need managing. That's why the sheep, they need the shepherd, don't they? Well, there's no point putting a person in a job and finding it's the wrong job and leaving them there because you're frightened to hurt them. You're a hireling. Be a man and, and deal with it in the right way, but take them out of the job for goodness sake. Because you, a pastor, is hindering the church when you've got people that you know are in the wrong jobs and you're frightened to take them out for what people think. You're hindering the growth of the church. And I've seen it so often, that's why I'm saying it's strong. I've seen it in the church. I remember my father and he, he didn't want to take somebody out of a job because they had a strong position in the church and this person had a lot of sway with the people in the church. So he left them there year after year after year and in the end it ruined the church. Because there was no freedom, God couldn't bring unity. Because the pastor could be disobedient if God revealed it to him. He's not doing the job he was meant to be and hindering the church. You've got to... Prune the tree, for goodness sake. Prune the tree. The Bible talks about it. Don't pity the flesh, God doesn't. Don't pity the flesh, pity the spirit, pity the unity of the body of Christ. And if there's a cancer, cut it out. If, if an arm's trying to be a leg, well, slap it and say, hey, get walking, stop trying to shake hands. Put them in the right place. And if you've got workers, move them, put them in the right place. The affirm will run smoothly, won't it? Because you're dissatisfied when you're a round peg in a square hole. They're not happy either, you know. They haven't got the courage to come and give the notice in. They'd probably love to have a better job, but they haven't got the courage to, to, to because they'll let the pastor down. You'd be amazed how many people are doing the duty in the church, frightened of letting the pastor down. They don't know that the pastor realises they're no good at it. Because if you're not functioning, you're no good at it, and you know it, and the pastor knows it. Isn't it silly, eh, we play games? <coughs> you don't help people by being weak. I know what I'm talking about. I, I could never delegate authority, it's funny. Because I was so proud, it made me insecure. You know that insecurity is a sign of pride. You're worried what people think of you. So it's pride. I was a very, very proud, egotistical person growing up. And because of that, I couldn't bear to not be in control of anything I was in. I was so much like a control freak. If I didn't have 100% control, I wouldn't, be, I wouldn't be involved with it. I didn't know that I could delegate authority and still have it. 
So I had to have it all and let people know. And if they disagreed with me, they were out. I was ruthless. I didn't care about people. Well, I'm the boss, so that's if you don't like it. Well, get out. You're stopping us doing the work. I mean, that's the world. I was full of the world. That was, was very carnal. That's the world, isn't it? Dog eat dog. If you're not with us, you're against us. So, you know, on your way, what's well, all right. I'd rather be on my own than somebody who couldn't come under my authority. But it was my insecurity. I was, it was terrible. I'm embarrassed now when I look back. But I have to be honest and assess myself. And it's to the glory of God I've changed. And I've had it very hard to delegate. So I know what I'm talking about. But I have more unity with my wife now and Alex and people who have been over because I've learnt how to delegate. I've had to. You can't grow. The man I worked for when I worked for gangsters, he was so insecure and so proud he couldn't delegate. How he ever let me be the manager, I don't know. But after 40 years, he still couldn't trust me. Would never let me put, you know, never let me sign a cheque or anything. He had to be in complete control. He couldn't delegate. And he knew I was a Christian. He knew I was honest. But he still couldn't trust me. He couldn't let go of the power. And because of that, he stayed a one-man business. If you can't delegate, you'll never have a big business. You cannot grow without delegation. Because it gets to the stage where you can't do it all yourself. If you want to be the bookkeeper and the bricklayer and the designer and every, the consultant and everything else, you can't do it. In the end, you've got to say, I'll let, I better get somebody else to the books. I better let somebody else to that. I'll just be the brains and I'll run the company. A lot of men stay one-man businesses because they can't delegate. That's all right. If they can't, then that's, that's good. Nothing wrong with a one-man business. I'm saying if you want to grow big, you've got to learn to delegate. If you don't want to grow big, that's all right. You have all the power and, and, and have the business. And that's, that's wonderful. That's not a criticism of you know, a small business. What about in the church? Well, you know my feelings on democracy, don't you? It's one of the world's systems, so it's one of the devil's systems. No better than capitalism or communism or fascism, Hinduism. It's just control of people. And actually, democracy... Well, communism was the... Which was supposed to be democracy, wasn't it? Power to the people was the forerunner of what we've got now. Which is a forerunner to the one world. In the Babylon teaching, I quoted, I think it was Aristotle, who talked about a Greek philosopher who actually coined the word democracy. And he said, the more democratic we become, the more prone we are to accept dictatorship. Now you'll have to think about that. It's profound and absolutely... Simple. We're so democratic now, we've got so many rights that we're deceived in thinking we've got all these rights and daily your rights are being taken away. In fact, the country has lost its rights in the name of democracy. Our sovereignty is now in Brussels. You can take your country to court if your country passes a law that contravenes the law in Strasbourg. You can take it to the court there. You can take your country to court and it can be overruled. Any law in this country can be overruled by a higher law, which is... And yet we're, we're saying we've got more rights all the time. Democracy leads up to dictatorship. The Russian Revolution didn't free the people, enslaved them more than they were under the Tsars, didn't it? They thought they were getting freedom, power to the people, and they ended up with a load of dictators. And Christians who believe in democracy are absolutely blinded, I have to say, because it's going to lead to dictatorship, the worst the world has ever known. The greatest democracy worldwide, the International Monetary Fund are lending billions of pounds to countries that they've made collapse with strings attached, so they'll become more democratic. Because the one world system cannot work with dictatorships because it wants to be the one world dictatorship. So it's got to make everywhere democratic to, to become the one world dictator. When the whole world is democratic, the one world dictator will arise. There's a prophecy. Only because it's common sense. It's not. Did you understand? That's why they're tr trying to make every country democratic. They lend billions of pounds to bail out the, the Asian collapse, didn't they? But the strings attached, change your politics and we'll lend you the money. Become more democratic. Read your papers, you'll see I'm right. So we've looked at marriage, we've looked at work, what about in the church? Oh, we're looking at it, democracy. Yes, I don't believe it's right. I'm not against 
shared leadership in, in the sense if there's three men, three main elders, so long as one has authority. But if three elders all have equal authority, that's unbiblical. It's against God's order all through the Bible. You don't have to fire one scripture at me out of context. All through the Bible, there's authority. There's no time, but if you make a note of it, Numbers chapter 12. Moses, who was the younger brother of Aaron and Miriam. Miriam was the eldest, wasn't she? She must have been 12 probably when she put him in the bulrushes. She couldn't have been three, could she, to put a brother in the bulrushes? So we'll say he was 7 to 12, years older than Moses. The Bible tells us that Aaron was three years older than Moses. We know that. So Moses was a younger brother, but as usual, God takes the weak thing to confound the mighty. So he chose the one who should. The firstborn should have had the inheritance. Aaron should have been the leader. But God always crosses his hands over, doesn't he? He said, don't try and sort God out. He crosses his hands over and says, Ephraim and Manasseh. Esau and Jacob. Cain and Abel. God, God knows what he's doing. And so God chose Moses, the little brother. And Aaron and Miriam despised it. Did you know they despised it? It only comes out in times of pressure. When somebody is after the authority in the church, if there's an elder who really would like to be pastor and think, I could run that church better than the pastor, he won't tell the pastor that. He'll tell his wife, maybe. But he won't tell him. He'll wait until there's times of pressure on the pastor. And so when Moses went up the mountain, Aaron took over. Disaster. The golden calf. He couldn't handle it. Moses said, Aaron, you're in charge. You have authority, delegated authority. I'm going up the mountain and I will come back. He didn't say, I'm going away, take over. He said, I'm coming back. It was 40 days. And in 40 days, the nation backslid because Aaron took authority when it wasn't his. It was only delegated and his delegated authority was to rule them till Moses came back. If they said, can we do this, can we do that? Wait till Moses comes back. I'm just here to solve your problems. But no major decisions when the man of God's away. No major decisions when your pastor goes away. Wait till he comes back, the man of God. And Aaron led them into backsliding. And God was going to kill Aaron. Moses had to pray for him. And then Numbers 12, it said, Now Moses married an Ethiopian woman. Well, I'm not saying that's good. God doesn't make a comment on it. But he was a Levite, wasn't he? And so he shouldn't have married an Ethiopian woman, but he did. And he thought, here's our chance. And Miriam and Aaron said, Hey, Moses. They didn't challenge him about the Ethiopian woman. They thought, we've got him. All the children of Israel know what he's done. Married an Ethiopian woman. They said, hey, why should you have all the authority? We're a family. It's a family business. It's a family affair, you know. Why can't Moses, Aaron and Miriam, why can't the three of us run Israel? There's three of us. Miriam says, hey, don't forget. I was the one who, who got prophesied when we come to the Red Sea and led the worship. You need a worship leader in the church? A lot have taken over. I said, a lot have taken over. <coughs> The pastor's frightened to lose his worship leader because half the church would leave. Because they, they love the worship, not God. They only come to church, I love the worship at that church. They're backslidden already. I thought you're supposed to love God. Does it matter if you went to church and there was no worship? We can't have a meeting now without an hour's worship. Why not have the word first? And see if there's any time left for worship. But we have worship and we'll see if there's any time left for the word. If God hasn't moved, you know, we'll give you a ten minute exhortation. Because it's the worship that'll feed you anyway. It's nonsense. Dancing around the golden calf. I'm not knocking music or worship. I'm a record producer. I understand about music, the power of it. I understand how it can seduce you to worship the golden calf to bow down to the statue in Nebuchadnezzar when you hear the music play. And Aaron says, and I'm older than you, Moses, and I'm the high priest, so why can't we share authority? 
He says, and God heard. And God came down suddenly. And then verse 3 is a funny little verse, and it's, it says, now the man Moses was the meekest in the whole of the earth. That's why he'd been given authority. You can delegate when you're meek, when you're not a bully. And when you're meek, you don't need to use your authority. God will stand by you. And God says, come out here, you three. And he told Aaron and Miriam off. He said, Miriam, you big head. You power seeker. He says, listen, Miriam, if I want to talk to you, I'll talk to you through a vision and a prophecy. But I speak with Moses face to face. So get in your place, Miriam. Carry on with your prophecy. Carry on with the leading the worship. Don't try and take over God's man. I speak to him face to face. You'll have to do with a few visions. And she got leprosy. And it was a family business. They were all three, but they should have had the place. Miriam as the prophetess, Aaron as the high priest, and the head Moses. If they stuck to authority, there was unity, but they all wanted equal authority. You can't, there's no such thing as equal authority. Because when you've got a decision, who, what do you do? You get compromise. The most terrible word in God's vocabulary. It's an abomination compromise. I'll spit you out of your mouth. You make me sick. I cannot stomach you. If you compromise, be hot for God or go and serve the devil. That's what it's be cold. Be stone, go and serve the devil, but don't come half-hearted to me because you make me sick. God cannot stand compromise. You have no idea how God hates it. He says, look, don't mix your seeds, don't sow wheat and rye together. It's an abomination. I don't, I don't like mixture. Don't let the priest wear linen and wool together. It's a mixture. Wool makes him sweat, and I don't want to smell the flesh. Let him wear linen. Don't mix those things together. A man going with a man, it's an abomination. It's the wrong mixture. God hates that. I can't emphasise how God hates compromise. Look in your dictionary what compromise is. It's lowering your standards for the sake of peace. Or words to those effects. Getting down from your standpoint of what you believe for the sake of peace. That's not peace, that's compromise. That sort of peace, you've got hell coming. That sort of peace, you've got a big fight on your hands later down the line. You just delay in the bang, it'll be bigger. You stick the cork on the kettle, it blows off all the harder. The longer it stays on, the bigger it blows off. You can't do it. I know I'm speaking strong, but we, we need to get the principles, don't we? Our relationship with God as men, we're under authority, but we also must exercise authority. As men, you know, we've not done it. Women's ministries are growing faster than men's, did you know that? Prayer meetings are full of women, not men. Go to the mosque. You'll see all men coming out. Men in their 20s and 30s. Not all ladies. How many young men have you got in your church? Vibrant young men. Between 20 and 35 at the prime of the... Somebody who can do something for God who can change things. The old people are not going to change it. The children are not. How many have you got in your church? See, Islam is a man's religion. Christianity is a woman's religion. If you knock on a door and, and say to somebody, I've come to tell you about our church, they say, hold on, I'll get my wife. Why? Because it's what church is for women, isn't it? It doesn't appeal to it, it's not for men. There's no appeal for men to become Christians. It's for women and old ladies. And it's our fault we've made it so, haven't we? Because men haven't used their authority. And that's why women are taking over in the church. So many women's ministries. I'm not criticising those. It's because of weak men. We should be leading. The women should be supporting the husbands who are in ministry, not doing the ministry while the husband sits at home praying for them. Shouldn't it? Shouldn't that be the order? Now, there's exceptions. I'm not saying a woman can't preach. What I'm saying, the order's getting reversed. And it's a difficult power balance, isn't it, between having authority and giving it. The centurion had it. He says, I'm a man under authority, and I also have authority. He understood the principle, so he got his miracle. Just because he understood the principle, I'm telling you. Because he said, if Jesus has authority, and he says, my son will be healed, he said, well, you better speak the word, because I understand about authority. I said to this man, go and saddle my horse. Get my armour. Yes, sir. 
He says, so if you're a man, I see you're a man in authority, Jesus. When you say to that devil, come out of the man, he goes, screaming. He says, you've got authority. I, I recognise you've got authority. He says, well, I've got authority, and I'm also under it. So he said, I've got the principle. So if you've got authority, will, will you ask my son to be healed? And he'd be healed. And Jesus says, yeah, it's done. And he went, and they met him on the way. He said, hey, your son's healed. He understood the principles. We'd get a lot more miracles if we understood, wouldn't we? But it's, it's not an easy balance. The more power we have that's not usurped, that we haven't taken it when it's not ours, the more we can share it and have a good balance. And this keeps relationship in, uh, and unity healthy. I'm finishing now for time. Never forget you are only using God's power. It's never your own. It's only delegated. Jesus said, I can do nothing of myself. We've looked at Romans 31 in the other study. All power is ordained of God. So if your boss has got power over you, with you, thank God for your boss, even if he's a stinker. Thank God for him. You ask God for you humility, how are you going to get it? Unless the boss picks on you every day. We're stupid now. Lord, give me patience. Well, that's why you've got an obnoxious boss. Thank God for him. God's ordained him to be there. Of course you put somebody next to you not nice, you've asked for the character of God. Well, one of them is long-suffering, so you'll have to suffer him for a long time to get long-suffering. This is Christianity. We don't float to heaven on a cloud because we're a Christian. We're, cruci we're crucified, we're Christ. No wonder we've no power. 2 Corinthians 4, 7. This treasure in his earth is in earthen vessels. That the excellency of the power may be of God. That's where the, remember we said that power and authority are, are the same. So the treasures in earthen vessels, that they'll know it's not your power but God's. I hate these words, come on let's give a hand clap for this mighty powerful man of God. He's not a powerful man of God, he's a weak sinner. It's God that's powerful, not the man. Why praise the man and give him a big head and let him think he's God's gift to man, this mighty anointed man? He's just as weak as you. He'll go home and have a row with his wife after that mighty anointed sermon, won't he? He'll go to a restaurant and probably have too much to eat. That's gluttony. Lust for food or he'll... It's crazy. He puts his treasure in earthen vessels that we may give God the glory, not the men. God will not share his glory with flesh. Why do the church do it? Why are we so stupid that we make idols out of preachers? It's not good for you and it's worse for them. That's why so many fall. They realise you're really easy pickings for money and for all sorts of things. And they start fleecing the sheep instead of feeding them. And it's your fault you've made them superstars. So the lack like one, why do you yelp? If you treat them like superstars, why do you yelp when they act like them? And manipulate you like all superstars do. Use you. End up as entertainment machines. Sad, isn't it? But the church has made them. If the church didn't praise them, they wouldn't have the, that attitude. 2 Corinthians 12, 9. My grace is sufficient for you in all your trials, in your marriage, in your work, in your church. Why? Because my strength, my power, my authority is made perfect in weakness. I'll finish there for sake of time. Let's endeavour to work at this balance. I need to work at it. As I say, I couldn't delegate any authority. I was a little Hitler. I know I say it a lot, but that's what I was like. I couldn't delegate. I was terrible. I wanted 100% or none. That was me. Ruthless. God's had to break me. And, and I realise there's probably a lot more, because of my background, probably a lot more to do. God put me with gangsters for 40 years to knock some out of me, my arrogance. So I, I need help. So let me finish there. Let, let's work at it. Remember the key points of this study is the difference between unity, which means equality, in relationship, and authority. Lord, I don't know whether the men have understood these concepts, Lord. I, it's taken me many years to try and understand it myself, Lord, and get the balance. And so I understand it takes many, many hearings, much thought. But, Lord, for me, it's been fundamental in changing, in not being frightened to delegate authority, knowing I don't lose it. In realising, Lord, that in my relationship with my wife, 
that they were equal, Lord, in relationship, but not in authority. And with you, Lord, that I can't believe, Lord, I'm equal with you. I in you and you in me, that we may be one. Lord, that's what you said about the Father, that you were, I and the Father are one. Lord, to say it about me is, I don't think we grasp it. I in you and you in me, that we're one. But you said it, Lord, in relationship we're equal. You're not ashamed to call us brothers. You made us co-heirs of your inheritance, Lord. It's unbelievable. And yet we realise, Lord, that you're our Lord and Master. You're our authority. You're the head, Lord. We're just the body. We just respond to you. And yet we're at one with you. Lord, this is a great mystery. And yet I feel we've unravelled it a bit today. Help us, Father. I'm not going to say any more, Lord. You can speak to us now. Amen.